it's been pretty amazing to be kind of at the at the forefront, at the cutting edge, to see all the uh, the luminaries in the field, and you find out that these these big names are just uh, people um, with a lot of common interests that overlap with yours, and who were only be too happy to talk with you about them. Hey everybody, hi, uh, welcome to my talk. I'm gonna be talking about plugin-based software architecture that we predominantly used in robotics projects. Um, my name is, oh, I'm gonna go over the outline of my talk first. Um, what is plugin architecture and why it's used? I'm gonna be stepping through how to design a simplified plugin architecture in C++. Um, then I'm going to go over PluginLib, which is a library used in robotics to implement plugin-based systems. I'm going to talk about MoveIt, which is a project I work on, and how it utilizes the plugin architecture. Um, finally, going to talk about some of the limitations when using this kind of system, and I'm going to summarize it at the end. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Abhi. I'm a robotics engineer at Picnic Robotics and I work with robotic arms. I'm also a MoveIt maintainer. Uh, MoveIt is a motion planning uh, platform that Picnic Robotics maintains. Okay, so what is plugin architecture? It's a software design pattern that allows for developers to add functionality to a larger system without having to alter the code of the core system itself. Uh, plugins are self-contained modules that are loaded into the system at runtime. A plugin architecture system has three components. Uh, the first is the core, and it defines how the system operates and it provides interfaces. The second are the plugins themselves. They are standalone independent components that contain implementation of the core application's features. And the most important component would be the plugin manager. And that is responsible for loading and unloading your plugins, finding the symbols in your um, plugin, and invoking the right functions to execute. OK, why would you use plugin architecture? Um, this would be really helpful if you don't want to nail down a specific implementation. Um, this is one of the solid principles, um, dependency inversion, where your uh, implementation, uh, your interface should not depend on your implementation. Uh, plugin architecture also allows us to write modular code. It can help organize large projects and reduce dependencies in the core system. This is another um, popular example of um, single responsibility uh, technique. Another reason to use this architecture is to write more testable code. Your interface can be mocked to test the core system, and your plugins can be individually tested as well. Plugins also simplify integration. Your core system should have a well-defined API, and the plugins would um, have the implementation. Uh, and this helps increase collaboration. Another advantage, you do not have to compile the entire project every time you make a change in your plugin. Uh, plugins can be loaded, updated, and deleted on the fly without application restart. Here are some popular C++ projects that use plugins. Um, this is, these are examples outside the robotics domain. Uh, your audio editing software like Audacity, text editors and ID like Eclipse, Visual Studio, Notepad++, image editing software like Photoshop, and game engines like Unreal and Unity all use plugins. OK, now let's design a simplified plugin architecture. Um, consider this core system. Let us design a system that will move, a, move robotic arms, and we're going to use a plugin-based system to design this. Uh, the required functionality of this core system is given a start and end robot state. We need to create a motion plan. So now your core system will contain the interface class. 
Um, this is an abstract class, meaning all your functions are virtual. And let's define robot state. The robot state comprises of the joint names and their position values. And the main function here that will have uh, the most important part is the plan function, which takes in a start state and an end state, and then gives you back a vector of robot state. Now that we have the interface, let's see how your plugin is architected. And this will contain the implementation. The simple motion planner in this case will inherit from the motion planner interface that we defined in our core system. And here in the plan function, you can override it and add your own simple motion planner. Now that we have written our plugin, how do we build it? And we should make sure when you build a plugin, it should be built as, just, as a shared library. Um, a shared library usually has the following extension depending on your operating system. It's a .so in Unix-based system, a .dll in Windows, and a .lib in Mac OS. Uh, there was a great talk on shared libraries just before my talk, so reference that in case you want to learn more about shared libraries. OK, so now we have the interface and the implementation. How do you load this plugin into your core system? And this is the role of the plugin manager. And it uses the concept of dynamic loading. Um, it comprises of these four major points. You need to be able to load your library into memory at runtime. You need to retrieve the addresses of the functions in your shared library. You need the capability to execute those functions. And then finally, unload the library from memory when it's not in use. So the first task of your plugin manager is to determine the path to these shared libraries, which are your plugins. Um, your path can be broken down into three parts. Uh, the prefix the folder is the folder where the library was installed to. Uh, if you're using CMake, you can get this from a CMake macro. Um, the second part is the shared library name itself. Uh, the third is the suffix, and it's the extension we discussed in our previous slide, and it's operating system dependent. Now that we have gotten our library path, the next task is to load and unload these shared libraries. And again, this is operating system dependent. On Unix systems, we have these system calls, DL open, DL close, to do that. And on Windows, there are API calls, load library, and free library to load and unload your shared libraries. So this is an example code of how it would look like. Um, DL open and DL close are part of the GNU C library. And you can refer the Linux man page to get more information about them. Uh, DL open loads the dynamic shared object given a string file path. And DLopen returns an opaque handle for the loaded object, which can be used by other functions like DLclose. OK, now that we have loaded the library into memory, uh, what's the next step? We need to create an instance of the implementation class. Um, and to do that, we can use the DLSim system call. Um, the DLSim system call obtains the address of a function in the shared object. Uh, a similar uh, function in Windows would be get proc address. OK, before we jump into using DLSim, I mentioned that they find the address of functions. So you need a few functions in your implementation class that's in your plugin. Um, here, I have two classes, uh, two functions, create instance and delete instance, which will create a, a simple motion planner instance. And notice that I have used extern C, um, and that means they are C functions. Um, why are they C functions? Uh, this is to prevent the C++ compiler from mangling the names of the function so we can find this function symbols. I've added a small 
table at the end to show that um, what the mangled name looks like. Uh, the compiler does name mangling because C++ supports function overloading. Um, the same function name can accept different kinds of input parameters and different number of input parameters. So the compiler has to mangle the name to differentiate them. Um, making them C functions um, would not mangle the name, as you can see. And you can find these mangled names by using this um, command line uh, operation to, in, in Linux machines. OK. Now we have added those two C functions in your implementation class. Now let's see how we use DLSim to invoke those functions. Um, the first step I'm going to do is create this function pointer. Uh, create motion planner instance is a function pointer that takes, and, and it points to a function that takes in no arguments and returns a I motion planner uh, pointer. So before we use DLSim, let's make sure we have loaded the shared library into memory by using DLopen. Now let's call the DLSim. Um, and you would provide the um, shared object handle and the name of the class, your name of the function you're searching for in the shared library. In, in our case, it's the create instance. And the DLSim function returns a void pointer, so you would want to um, convert it to a point of the appropriate type before it can be used. In our case, um, we have created this uh, function pointer to cast to. And now that we have um, the function create instance, um, we can call upon it which will invoke the C function we, have we had implemented in our plugin. And now that we have this motion planner, we can call the plan function. Uh, we can add more functions to it and play around with it before um, we call the DL close function. Um, remember to call the delete instant instance function before unloading the shared library from memory. So this is a very simplified version of what happens inside a plugin manager. Uh, your plugin manager can get way more complex. Um, these are some of the things that plugin manager has to take care of. It has to keep track of all the plugins loaded into memory, have some sort of plugin registry. Um, it needs to be able to work with static libraries too, so that you can provide default implementations that come with your core system. Um, your plugin manager should be cross-platform. Here I showed you examples of how to use DLopen, DLClose, and similarly we have other system calls in Windows. Your plugin manager should be able to handle working across all operating systems. And finally, your plugin manager is responsible for memory management. Now that I've talked through how a simple, simple plugin manager works, I want to talk about plugin lib, which is a library we use in ROS projects to implement plugin architecture. So what is ROS? Um, ROS is Robot Operating System. And despite what the name says, it's actually not an operating system, but it's a set of libraries and tools to help build robotic applications. Um, all the ROS libraries are open source, and ROS helps implement this pub-sub architecture. Um, you can see uh, uh, the image over there where um, ROS helps launch different nodes, and nodes can communicate to each other over a network layer. If we have nodes, why use plugins for ROS projects? Um, as you see, your nodes here can um, can implement different uh, features of your project. Say I want to load Motion Planner A, I can just launch a node that executes Motion Planner A and substitute with a different Motion Planner as a different node if I don't want to use the first one. 
But we don't want to do that because network layer communication delays between node can, is not deterministic. Uh, we need plugins for performance. But in a perfect world, ROS would not need plugins. So plugin lib is the de facto plugin manager for ROS projects. And it's built on top of a few other libraries like class loader, RCPP utils, and RC utils, which takes care of the system level calls. Plugin lib provides high level functions to be called in the core system. And plugin lib is cross platform. So coming back to our system um, that we designed for motion planning. We have the interface, the iMotion Planner class, and we have the implementation class, the Simple Motion Planner. How do we load the Simple Motion Planner plugin using PluginLib? The first thing you would want to do is register the plugin. This is a replacement for the C functions I had added in the implementation class previously. Uh, PluginLib provides this macro that you add at the end of the implementation class. Um, and the macro takes the base and derived class types as arguments. Uh, this macro helps us create the factory methods. Um, so that macro calls um, this particular macro, which creates a static object of type proxy exec unique ID. Um, the main thing to be concerned is it, it actually invokes this register plugin function. Um, and it takes in the derived and base class type and sends those as arguments to this function. The register plugin is a free function in class loader. And uh, we create a meta object object using the base and derived class details. Let's investigate more what the meta object object holds. And that would contain the factory functions, the functions to create and destroy the instance of the derived class. Um, so this way, we don't need to add the C functions to our implementation class. We just use the macro um, that, the, uh, that PluginLib provides. And class loader also has this static map variable uh, that keeps track of all the factory functions. OK, now we have the functions to create and destroy your derived class object. Uh, now, how does PluginLib figure out the path to the shared libraries? And it does so by creating, by asking users to create this XML file, which, uh, which holds information on plugin name, the shared library name, the base and derived class type. Now let, let's see how the core system loads the motion planner. The first thing that we would do when using PluginLib is create a class loader instance, which takes in the package name as an argument. And this is where the XML file resides. And, and we look for the XML file in that path and parse it to get all the information about library name and base and derived class type. And also on construction of the class loader object, a DL open system call will be made to load the plugin into memory. And now that we have loaded into memory, we need to create a unique instance of our derived class type. Uh, and we would do that by calling this function called create unique instance. Um, and the input per argument here is the name of the plugin specified in the XML file. And the create unique instance will invoke the factory function to return an instance of the derived class. Now we can call the plan function that we implemented in the simple motion planner class. So right now, the package name and the um, simple motion planner, I have hard coded into the code. But these can be made ROS2 parameters. 
So essentially, these are input parameters that can be read from a YAML file when the system is first started. And it can be modified during runtime using command line tools, or there are other programmatic ways to do so. So in this um, manner, we can change out our plugins during runtime. So just summarizing how Pluginlib made it so easy to create your own plugins. Um, all you would do is add that export macro in your implementation file. You would add an XML file, which contains the library name, plugin name, base class type, and derived class type. Um, there are some CMake macros you want to add so that the class loader will know the location of your XML file. And finally, your core system creates the class loader instance and then calls the create unique instance function to create an instance of whatever plugin you want to load. Now that I've gone through how Pluginlib works, I want to talk more about MoveIt, it's the project that I work on, and it uses plugins extensively. Um, what is MoveIt again? Um, it's an open source robotics manipulation platform, and it does a lot more than just motion planning. It can help uh, with grasping, 3D perception, robot control, and kinematics. And MoveIt has been built on top of ROS and ROS2. ROS2 is a newer, newer version of ROS. So these are the different plugin interfaces we have in MoveIt. <laughs> Since we were planning about motion planning, one of the most important interfaces is the planning plug, uh, the planning interface to accommodate for planning plugins. Um, the plugins built on top of this uh, come from other libraries like OMPL, which is maintained by a research lab at Rice University, uh, Pils, which is maintained by a German company called Pils, and Stomp. Uh, came out from a research paper from an ICRA conference 10 years ago. Uh, another important uh, usage of plugins is for kinematics. Um, with robots, we often work in, in joint space. That is, we can um, work with the joint values themselves, or you want to know the Cartesian location of your end effector and we want to have capability of going back and forth from those two uh, states. Um, there are a lot of implementations for that, and we have plugins built on top of TrackRK, which comes out of Track Labs, which is another research organization. KDL is Kinematics and Dynamic Library, maintained by Oracos. Um, BioIK was something developed by a research um, uh, by a student for his master's thesis. And we also use PICIK, which we develop and maintain internally at Picnic Robotics. Uh, another interface we have uh, is for 3D scene updater. We work with different sensors, um, so we want different uh, ways of incorporating depth sensor values, LIDARs, sonars, cameras, etc. We also have interface for collision detection uh, so that we don't run into people and things while we're moving from place to place. And these are two common uh, libraries we depend on to create collision plugins, FCL and Bullet. And then these are uh, called planning request adapters, what it basically means, we need um, polishing of your mo motion plan. For example, uh, the first one, fixed start state and collision. If your start state is in collision, we want to slightly move around the arm so that it comes out of collision before we can do a motion plan. Uh, second one, fixed workspace bound so that your arm just moves around in one local area. Um, trajectory smoothing. So there are different kinds of processing you can do to your motion plan. And these are implemented as plugins. 
the controller manager. We can also control the robots using different techniques. You can either send them position commands, you can determine the velocity of each joint, and you can command it that way. Um, and you can also specify effort. Effort is mostly to make sure that your arm doesn't jerk, that your difference in acceleration is not too huge. OK, um, so that's all the different plugins um, Moveit uses. And in case you want to build your own plugin-based system, here are some resources if you don't want to use pluginlib. Uh, you can use BoostDLL. It's a headers-only library. And it contains the low-level API through the shared library class to invoke your system calls like dlopen and dlclose. And they've got really good tutorials as well to, to, to help you implement your own plugin system. Uh, you can look into POCO, which also has the shared library class to do system level calls and helps with developing cross-platform uh, application. And finally, if you are already using Qt to ha uh, develop some UI applications, you can, use, you can look into Qt plugins. OK, so coming into um, what are the limitations of plugin architecture? Your plugins have to be compiled with the same or compatible compiler as the core system. And this is because different compilers and different versions of the same compiler can have different name mangling techniques. Another limitation is your API needs to be fairly stable because uh, your plugins need standardized interfaces. You cannot keep breaking uh, ABI. Another limitation is testing individual plugins might be easy, but it is unknown how multiple plugins working together will affect the system. Um, I'm going to give a small example from the MoveIt uh, plugins that we discussed earlier. Remember, there were two uh, trajectory uh, cleaning plugins I talked about. One is fixed start state and collision, and fixed work. the other one is fixed workspace bounds. Um, Fixed start state and collision might move your start position out of the workspace bound. So you never know how these two are going to work with each other and might produce failed results. Um, and finally, some security issue. Um, even a well-meaning plugin may contain a bug which can crash the system or leak memory. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm at the end of my talk. Here's some takeaways uh, that I hope you had with this talk. Um, we talked about what is plugin architecture. It is loading modules at runtime. When you should use this architecture, um, I discussed some important concepts, uh, which, is, which are runtime polymorphism and dynamic loading. I talked about how to create your own plugin-based system and how PluginLib implements that. Uh, and we also talked about how MoveIt uses PluginLib. And we finally went over some drawbacks. Um, my colleague, Anthony, here um, tried implementing the simplified version of the plugin system. And the code resides at this link here. Um, you can use the QR code if you want to look at it right now. Uh, and yes, all the libraries that I discussed today are open source. So you can contribute. Uh, you can bring your C++ skills. You can make your own robot and try to use MoveIt to motion plan. And yeah, finally, do check out Picnic Robotics. We are the unstructured robotics company based out of Boulder, Colorado. And we're always looking for engineers to work on cool applications. Uh, ranging from berry farms to the International Space Station. Yeah, thank you for coming to my talk. Hi, really appreciated your talk. It was great. Uh, I had a few questions about, um, I guess, 
best practices you could say with these plugins. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one would be, for those unfamiliar, Ross also has Ross components. And I'm kind of curious how you think plugins kind of compare and contrast to plugins and when I should use components or plugins. Wait, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so I'm curious how Ross components would be used compared to how plugins are used currently and kind of what your recommendation would be about which tool to use when. Uh, they're independent of each other. Um, plugins you would want to use when you uh, want quick load time and planning time. Mm -hmm. um, you can use ROS nodes to spin up a motion planner for say, mm -hmm. um, and you can send a request, hey, I want a mo motion plan from part A to point B, but there might be communication delays. Um, okay. So at that point, you might as well just load it as a plugin. I think that might depend on your DDS implementation, because mm -hmm. I think you do need, like a ROS component I think is a .so eventually, um, and depending on your DDS implementation and your transport protocol, you might be able to use shared memory. But I, I don't know, I don't know what would be better performance-wise or anything like that. So if you maybe want to run this system across multiple machines, mm -hmm. you might want to consider using them sure. as ROS components. Sure. But if it's all running on one computer, I, I would recommend just using them as plugins. That's a good argument. Um, and then the other question I had regarding that was, what? Do you guys have any opinions on like RLCPP calls in your plugins? Like, for example, should I create a topic in a plugin or should I kind of purposely keep that away from my plugins? Uh, since the plugin implementation completely depends on you, you can definitely add whatever mm -hmm. you want. Um, Do you recommend it though? That seems a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see a use case for it on the top of my head right now. Okay, but, okay. thank you so much. Hey, great talk. I'm curious about what your opinions are for best practices for unit testing and integration testing these plugins. Uh, you can mock your plugin interface and test your core system. Um, and your plugins are responsible for testing their individual functionality. Uh, there, there's been pretty great talks about functional programming and testing improvements by using functional programming. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would say your plugins can be tested by itself and your core system can be tested by mocking your plugin interface. Would you use simulators for this or would you, you know, test it on uh, like, let's say a hardware in the loop? Uh, you can have unit tests, but most of them, in, in at least robotics, you have to have a hardware in loop uh, to see what really happens. Thank you. Hey, this is a good talk. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, so regarding ROS2, does that support plugins as well? I know you, so yes. there is support for that? Yes. Um, okay, um, because I've not used that, so that's good to know. And then you also mentioned um, in one of your slides, plugin lib was cross-platform. Uh, I think it was way early in your slides. Um, so I was just curious, does that mean it's able to like parse um, you're able to use DLL files as well as yeah. shared. Okay. Yes. So I guess there's no way to ensure like ABI stability between them and you just have to make sure. I, I, I'm guessing, I guess, depending on what compiler you use, you would have there's a potential for ABI mismatch. Yeah. Um, does Plus, uh, the plugin lib have any anything in that regard, or is it just up to you to make sure it's um, Yeah, I don't think plugin lib has uh, internal features to decide if you use the compatible compiler or not. Um, okay, if, yeah. If you're loading in a plugin that's not compatible, it's just going to throw a symbol error, lookup symbol error, of, and then you got to update okay. your library to make sure the interface is um, Okay, and how would, how would that work if that those were loaded at runtime though? So would that crash your application? Yes, it'll crash your application. Okay. And, and yeah, there's no way good good way 
for the compiler to give you yeah. an error other okay. than saying, hey, I can't find this function or this, this class that you're talking about. OK, OK, thanks. Hey, so you uh, were you mentioned the potential security and uh, problems and whatnot with like memory leaks and null pointer dereferences. Uh, are you aware of any way to mitigate those kinds of problems so that they don't occur within your plugins so that your system stays alive? That could be something your plugin manager can handle. So you can have checks to make sure that you're not uh, leaking memory. Do you have any? Anything like? Do you have a specific suggestion? Like, is there a, a specific function call that I should be aware of to try that? Okay. No, I'm sorry. Thank you. Hi, uh, really great talk. I enjoyed that. Um, are you typically writing your own plugins or using pre-existing ones? Uh, there's a lot of for Moveit. Um, since Moveit has been around for about ten years now, there's a lot of plugins already out there, uh, but it has the capacity to, you know test with other other implementations as well. OK. Um, and if you're writing your own plugins, um, when would you prefer to do that versus using like the strategy design pattern? I'm not aware of the strategy design pattern. Oh, uh, you can like choose which kind of thing you want to use at runtime. Um, so like, you know, if you're doing path planning, you could choose A star or Dijkstra's or whatever you wanted at runtime or whenever. Yeah, so you would have different plugin implementations for A star and Jigstra, uh, and and if I, if I recall correctly, I talked about ROS two parameters, and that's what you would use to figure out which motion planner you want to use at runtime. Right. Uh, so you would recommend like always using a plugin then, um, in that case, where you want runtime differentiation. Uh, this is a way of doing it. Uh, I'm not sure how the other, this would be better than the other. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>